Speaking of water, I've been a bit dehydrated. You know, I'm doing the, the keto thing, and, and I'm still going, baby. I'm still going. Got a little cotton mouth. They said that's part of the deal. I'm okay with that. And uh, they say, you know, when you fully adapted, it's kind of funny. They call it fat adapted. When you have become fat adapted, it's because your body no longer relies on the carbohydrates for fuel. It, it knows now to use fat, which is a good thing. So your body becomes an oven to burn fat. And uh, I feel like an oven, really. I can feel it cooking, but, but it, it kind of brought me back to a specific scenario in my 20s. I used to work out at 24-hour fitness. Anybody heard of 24-hour fitness? I think probably most of you had. And I would go to the gym in Chesterfield. It's where I met my, my wife. She's somewhere. It's where I met Michelle and actually proposed to her. As romantic as that is, I proposed to her at 24-hour fitness. And I remember way before I met her, I was still going there. And I remember I was sitting there on the butterfly machine one day, just flexing, right? Just pumping iron and, and not thinking much of it. And this guy comes up who works there, and he's a trainer, so his opinion matters, right? It's, he knows fitness. He said, hey, you're a baseball player, aren't you? I said, no. I said, I played Little League like once, but I was scared of getting hit by the ball, so I quit, and I only played with tennis ball in the neighborhood because I was scared of the baseball, and I wouldn't ever, I wouldn't ever really step up to the plate because I was scared. But he thought I was a, some type of professional baseball player, and I'm scratching my head, and it was really a compliment. As I left, I realized he didn't know my past, see? He saw me for where I was at that stage, and, and I was thinking, hey, I, I'm doing all right. Yeah, this guy thinks I'm some kind of athlete. All right, I'll take that. But, see, he doesn't know that now I use terms like fat adapted, but when I was a kid, I used the F word all the time, like fat. Yeah, I said it. I thought I was fat when I was a kid. I was chunky, and I had a serious complex over it most of my childhood. See, he didn't know my past. He didn't know where I grew up. He didn't know that I had to do the scoliosis test in gym class, and I'd take my shirt off, and the kids were laughing at me because I was, you know, chubby, and I had the, the little rolls, you know. I had that, and I had the flabby, you know, you know what I'm saying. He didn't know that, that, that I had that memory with me forever since, and I've never forgotten the kid laughing. And he didn't know that I was embarrassed to swim in swimming pools because of how I looked, so I'd wear a t-shirt until I was probably a teenager. Uh, it was awkward. But see, I was starting to buy into the hype that a couple people teased me, and I thought that's all I could be, so I might as well just play the role. He didn't know that I wore a leather jacket from sixth grade through eighth grade, sixth grade through seventh grade, and then I downgraded to a windbreaker completely throughout the entire year. It would turn beet red in the face and almost pass out because I was so uh, bothered by the way I looked. I didn't want people to see that. Now keep in mind, people, it wasn't as bad as it was in my mind. See, my perception of it was worse. But that moment when he said that, it wasn't an egotistical thing. It was, wow. He doesn't see that. That's what touched me. He didn't see that. And I saw, see, see, I got in wrestling when I was like 15, and people said, you're going to get your, you know what, kicked. You probably shouldn't do that. You're not tough enough for that. And guess what I did? I got my butt kicked for a little while, and then I started hitting the weights. Then I started kicking some butt myself once in a while. Once in a while. Most of the time, I got my butt kicked. When I wrestled my brother, I got my butt kicked. But I wrestled normal people who weren't superhuman, I would, I would sometimes kick their butt. So it was, a, it was a give and take, but I was making progress. And by the time I got to my 20s, I had forgotten all this, you know, to some degree, and I'm in that gym, and he didn't know all that that came with it, you see? His perception of me was different because he didn't know me back then and how I felt and how I limited myself. He didn't know me as that chunky little kid who liked to eat more than he could handle, who liked to get too many things at McDonald's, who liked to cook way too many pizza rolls and way too many chicken strips, and he would eat them when he wasn't hungry, and I'd just sit around and play video games, and he didn't know all that, and that carried with me, and I knew by my teenage years I had to get in a gym and do something. He didn't know all that. You see, it's normal people judge us by how they know us. Your family is going to look at you how they know you. It's based on the role you play in each other's lives, how you're viewed, and what you're capable of. 
but we've all been misjudged and limited by our friends, family, and outsiders at certain points in our life. Our potential in that season was missed and we were pre-stamped with a certain worth or a capped expectation. Capped meaning it can't go over this. It can't. You're not able. We felt devalued to almost nothing when we had a treasure deep inside of us all along. Treasure. But my question to you is, is it possible we've been living according to what the world says we can never become instead of what God has already prepared us to become? You see, we can miss it because we're living according to what others are saying we can only do. We can't do that, so you shouldn't even try. But you weren't called according to the restrictions of the world but according to the will of God on your life. God calls. People don't, except on their phones if they're not texting you. I guess they still make phone. Do people still make phone calls today on smartphones, or is it really just Marco Polo? It's a little text. Do, phone, do phones exist anymore? Anybody? You guys with me? We are going to look at a really good scripture today. Matthew Chapter 13, verses 54 through 58. Even Jesus struggled with this problem. Jesus could do anything, anytime. He was God, but he still struggled when it came to the people he grew up with in his home town of Nazareth. It says, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, in their synagogue, he came back, he'd been gone a while, he came back and he taught in their synagogue of Nazareth. So they did, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Jose, Simon, and Judas? And it's not James, sons of thunder, James and John, it's James, his brother, Book of James, and it's not Judas the betrayer, it's Judas' his brother, a different, different J. And his sisters, are they not all with us? When did this man get all these things? This is Jesus. So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except, everybody say except, in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. We know that God can't move without faith, and faith is belief and action. So God won't move until you act in faith. He doesn't move, and then, he doesn't move and then you move. You move, and then he moves. So because they would not believe, his hands were tied. He's like, I can't. I can't work with you people. Too complicated. I'm going to go elsewhere. You just think I'm a carpenter? I got more in my bag of tricks. I'm more than a carpenter. So he didn't do many miracles in Nazareth. He fled. You see, some of us have this mentality. It's, it's the way we live every day. But you need to buy a ticket, a one-way ticket out of Nazareth. You need a one-way ticket out of Nazareth. You see, God fulfills your destiny with each step you take in faith. No faith, no destiny. And when you stay in Nazareth, no destiny. We got to get out of that. We got to get out of that limitation because in Nazareth, you're just the kid next door. You're just the kid next door like I was. My buddy next door growing up, Kent, my, my buddy, he was my, my buddy. But to me, Kent was the kid next door, and to Kent, I was the kid next door. And we play video games in the summer, and we play hide and go seek. And you know, the neighborhood kids, we'd we'd uh, you know, we'd have like lunch sometimes at different places, and we'd do things. Sometimes we're really mean to each other, but that was our perception of each other, and that's it. 
We didn't know that we'd grow up to do completely different things, but we had to separate. And now if I saw Kent, who I haven't saw in years, I'm sure that he would bring things to the table that I'd be like, wow, I didn't know that was in you. And he'd see me and go, wow, I didn't know that was in you. Because that's all we knew of each other. We were just the kid next door. Our impression of someone else is based on how we know them. It's natural. It's not intentional. They're not trying to devalue you. That's just how they know you. They don't know everything that's in here because we haven't shown them, per se. Just because Jesus, Jesus said a few good words, to them, he was just a little kid with Joseph and Mary that, you know, was born in the manger. He wasn't. He was just Jesus. They didn't know. The role they play in their lives, in our lives, is how we define what they are to us, the kid next door. But the kid always grows up. We wear a lot of hats in our life. You know, just because I'm a dad to my kids doesn't mean I'm not a brother to my brother. And just because you don't know I'm a brother doesn't mean I'm not one. And just because I'm a son to my dad doesn't mean I'm not a son because you don't know I have a dad that's alive and, you know, everybody has a dad, of course. Jesus' dad was the Holy Spirit, if you want to get technical. They don't know. But just because they don't know doesn't mean it's not so and doesn't mean you can't pursue it. You got to leave Nazareth. Nazareth is that restriction, that world that says you can't go beyond what others say you can go beyond. That won't take you to destiny. If you live according to others' restrictions, you will never do anything with your life. The angle people know you as is based on the role you play in their life. And you may have a passion that people don't understand. People don't know you have passion. There's things I'm still learning about my own family. I didn't know they had that interest in me, them about me and my friends and, and all kinds of things. And I didn't, I didn't know those things about them because we never talked about it. They were just, you know, family or the kid next door. And sometimes people will restrict you because they're not really willing to leave Nazareth themselves. When you say, hey, I'm thinking about Think about getting a ticket out of here. They're scared for themselves, and they're going to tell you why you shouldn't do it. And we're not talking about really leaving here now, people. We don't want you to go anywhere. We're talking about a mindset. You need to get out of the trapped mindset that you can't go beyond what the world tells you, that you're believing is your capped potential. The world calls it a, wa a rat race. A rat race. A rat? A rat race. It's the cotton mouth. But with God, it's a one-man show. There's no competition in the world. It's not a race. It's a one-man show with God. He fulfills your destiny, not people. He works through people, but if it's his will, it will happen. And we don't want you to end up with regret. Because regret comes when you don't execute on something you had in your heart and you know you should have at least given it all you had. But if you don't want to get out of Nazareth and you want to stay on the couch, if you find regret, there you go. It's easy to get offended when others doubt you. They may laugh at you. They may not see what you see. And it's easy to get offended, but you don't have to get offended because they don't know those things. You got to show them with action. Talk is cheap, right? Anybody can talk, but action is what builds respect. When I was going to say, I, I, say, I said I wanted to be a singer, like, I told my parents, I want to be a singer. And, hey, I found this school in Nashville, and they'll help you get into the music business. And, and it was just talk, talk, talk until I said, okay, I'm really going. Whoa. It was deep, and it was hard, and there was tears. And I'm, I, I'm not advocating leaving for real because I hope my children never try to pull that one on me. I'm going to be way tougher on my kids than my parents actually let me go. But for me, that's what it took to turn me into a man, and it did. And I really had to go, and when I went, now people said, whoa, I didn't know he had that in him. I didn't know he was willing to really do that. I thought he was just, you know, the kid next door with the scoliosis thing in the, in the jacket. God has more in you. He wants to get out. 
He has more in you. Life is going by and he wants to get it out. And if he doesn't get it out, you're going to have regret because you'll never find that fulfillment until he gets it out of you. He'll fill you as you give out what he's put in you. But it takes building respect and not all callings are of God. You have to discern the spirit. The Bible says, try the spirits to know if they are of God like an American idol. Is that show still on? Thank the Lord. It is. Reruns. Listen, just because your kid's on American Idol and you, you think they're good and then they get put on the reject show, it doesn't mean they were called to be a rock star because maybe it's not God's calling that they sing and sing, love to cry me a river, cry me a river. Justin Timberlake? Nobody? You don't remember Cry Me a River? That just came out of nowhere. American Idol is an example where not everybody's called Few are chosen. Find your calling. God's calling on your life is unique to you. Doesn't mean you have to do what I do. Doesn't mean you have to do what he does. Doesn't mean you have to do what she does. It's unique to you. It's your blueprint. Find your blueprint because it's important. If God put it in you, it's important and we need it to come out for the glory of God. That's how you're going to build respect. You know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Are you, guys, are you guys alive out there? Come on, what can I do? Jumping jacks? Come on now. Come on now. You guys got a pulse? Come on. I ain't here talking to myself. Come on. You know Aretha Franklin? Come on, the greatest gospel singer, soul singer. Come on. Respect, right? It takes respect. They didn't respect Jesus. They didn't respect him. That's why he was just a carpenter's son. Because he's just from Nazareth. He's just a kid next door. But they were missing everything because they didn't know him that way. He had to build their respect. How do you build respect? You build credibility through action. The apostles looked at Jesus differently, didn't they? Why is that? Because they were together all the time. They tarried or stayed with him. They were together. They saw more than just his, his poetic talking and his beatitudes. They saw him healing people and doing things with them and, and, and being in the slums, in the pits with the sinners and trying to make the sick whole. And so it built respect. Don't let People judge you based on your past. They will take your preconceived notions of your past and try to apply it to your future. But that's not how God looks at it. He doesn't decide your future based on your past. They will conclude your ability based on what they know about you until you build respect. God fulfills your destiny with each step you take in faith. And as you take those steps, you're establishing credibility. You're establishing respect. It's okay they don't understand. But it doesn't mean you don't have valid desires in your heart. You have to earn respect. It's not just given to you. And it's not intentional. They just don't know you that way. But the fruits of your faithfulness, guided by action, will reveal to those doubters there is more to you. God defines your credentials. You know what credentials are like when you log into a website? And if you're an administrator, you get to do everything. And if you're just like an editor, you get to do some dangerous stuff. And if you're just a, a normal user, you're limited. But see, God wants to make you full, full in control. He gives you the credentials you need to have full control. When you hand it to him, he gives you access to those things. And those same people who doubted you, when you do leave Nazareth, guess what they're going to do? They're going to leave too. Because now they're being converted. Now those who doubted you become your followers. You're discipling into them what they said you could never do because you had the guts and the faithfulness to step out first. Now they will follow you. But you have to be willing to leave. You have to be willing to depart from the boundaries of doubt. Depart from the boundaries 
of doubt. The boundaries of doubt is Nazareth. Some of us right now need to leave Nazareth. You're in Nazareth right now. It's a mindset. It's the willingness to leave that old way of thinking that I'm not able and I'm not good enough and I'm not smart enough and gosh darn it, people don't like me. Yes, they do. They will like you. Step out. They will see more than the, the, the cheap imitation red and white leather jacket on the last day of school getting off the school bus, kid red in the face about to pass out. They'll see more than that than the kid with the crooked shoulder because he had bad posture all his life because he was doing this because he was ashamed of how his, fl his flabby belly looked. They'll see more than that. But you got to leave. You got to step out and say, I don't care. I'm going. I'm going to see what God has for me. There's people who stay confined to that definition of what the world says they can only be. And they live in what we call the wheelhouse in the technical realm. It's, it's, it's their comfort area. It's where they have experience. And they're, they're never willing to put their whole body in. They just dabble. They just come, you know, they come when they need something from God, and then the rest they got it covered. They're always dabbling. But those are the people that never seem to get better. They stay salty, as I heard another pastor recently say. They stay salty, and they keep going through this circle because they never fully get engaged with God. They never leave. They want to stand on the border. Well, there's, there's the 7-Eleven there's the I grew up by, and there's the, they got Super Walmart in Naz. What am I going to do without the lunch meat and the, and the smoked cheddar from Super Walmart if I leave Nazareth? It's not gonna, what, they don't have one out here. Come on now. You got to leave. You got to get all in. All in, God wants. God defines my potential. No man defines your potential. God defines your potential. And faithfulness is what builds my step towards God's plan. God can't move just like Jesus did not move when they did not believe. God can't move without faith. Do you believe he will give you an increase? Do you believe he's got more for you? Come on, who believes? Who believes God has more for you? Okay, you believe God has more for you. Well, he will give you more as you step out and ask for more. But if you wait for him to drop it on your lap, he's saying, well, you first. Because many, many mighty works weren't done here because of unbelief. See, belief is action. Takes action. Faith is action. Belief in action. He's got more for all of us. And what's cool is when you think you've, like, arrived, he says, I got more. I got more for you. But we've got to be willing to move. You know, to some of you guys, some, some, someone new came in a second ago, and they just poked their head in. And that's the first thing they've seen. This is the first glimpse of one seed church they've seen. But see, to me, I remember setting up the Bible study signs all by myself last year, which feels like an eternity to me. So to me, this, this transformation has taken place. And I remember sitting in the Bible studies with no one except my wife, I think, was there, and my parents were mostly there, and that was it. And let me tell you, it was discouraging because the devil wanted to say, no one's going to come. You might as well not do this. These people don't need to be fed. They're good. It's like St. Louis. People aren't hungry out here. And I disagreed. I said, no, no devil. Y yes, they are. They don't know they're hungry. But see, I'm here to declare that they are hungry and they don't know they're hungry. And when they get a taste of this bread and this drink, they're going to be starving because now they're going to know what being, being fed is really about and how to get really full. They've been eating those carbs, but they need a good fat adapted diet to really full, feel for full and sustained in the name of Jesus. So we plowed through it. We plowed through it, and then January came, and now we're in July, and guess what? The one year is going to come up like that, and we're going to be shouting, going, look at what God has done, because God has done things. And sometimes, sometimes you leave Nazareth, like, I've, I've been gone for a long time from Nazareth, but still sometimes I feel like nothing's happening. It is, though. God doesn't move on our timeline. He's not going to do it 
I think he purposely doesn't do it the way we expect him to because then we would not rely on him. So he's going to keep doing it and surprising us and keep building and doing all these things. And this church is a perfect testimony of this illustration because we had to leave Nazareth to see it get to where it is here. And we're going to keep walking on our one-way ticket out of Nazareth. Can you guys stand to your feet with me? Your Nazareth is the place where others have restricted you. They judged you. And they didn't judge you intentionally, per se. They judged you, though, what they knew of you. And they said, Vincent, that's all you're worth. You can never be that, Vincent. But they don't fulfill your destiny. God does. And God knows what's in your heart, and he wants to bring out of your heart what he has that's going to glorify him, and that's what he's doing. So you keep walking, and we all have that special thing. The doubter's influence is the devil's way of trying to poison you and stop you from leaving that small town. But if you keep walking, you're going to convey, convert the doubters. The haters are going to become followers of Christ. You keep planting and watering, and God will give the increase. When you leave, oh man, whoo, I'm thinking about it right now. Me and my wife talk about this all the time. Remember when they had no time for us? They didn't want to even come over for dinner because we weren't good enough. You know, it wasn't good enough. And in five years, they're going to be saying, hey guys, I'm going to say, sorry, we left Nazareth. We're gone. We don't have time anymore. It's not because we don't like you. It's because we left and you weren't following when we told you we were going. Don't miss the opportunity to follow. Don't miss the opportunity to shine your light on someone else to follow. That's why, you know, a lot of you are really good. We, we bring guests. We tell people that's what it's about, is we're continually planting the seed whether they get it or not because one day God's going to increase that seed in them and they're going to remember who planted it in them and God will prick their heart. God fulfills your destiny with each step you take in faith. If you want to see God move, leave Nazareth. Don't let fear stop you from executing your next step. I'm not saying don't be crazy. I've talked about this. Try the spirits. The spirit doesn't tell you to go jump off a building. But the spirit may be saying, hey, Try taking another step for God. What can that be? Maybe I need to pray more. Maybe I need to pray for others more. Maybe I need to go to church more. Maybe I need to read my Bible more. Those are the steps I'm talking about to leave Nazareth. And some of, some of us do that. Well, there's, there's more. There's more. There's more. Tell God, I want more, God. I need more. I don't know what to do next. Tell him, show me, Lord, in prayer. He will. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He will ne never leave any man astray. He will go back for his sheep. If you call, but you have to call. Pick up the phone in Marco Polo app, Jesus. Say, Jesus, I don't know. Hey, you know, and send it to him. God, can, God has internet, right? He's got really good bandwidth, by the way, in heaven. He's got the fastest connection in heaven, and he doesn't have to worry about buying data like we do. It's great. It's a mindset. Let God lead your course of action and leave all the haters in the small town, and they'll leave soon enough. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Let's, let's pray for a minute. If some of you guys have a need, while we have our eyes closed, no one's looking, just raise your hand because God sees it. God sees it if you have a need. If you have a restriction that you want God to touch you and help show you how, to, how do I leave Nazareth? How do I do that? Just lift your hand in the air and reach out to him. Submit to him and he sees you. He sees you. So, Lord, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus, and we bring these needs to your table. We're not looking for crumbs, Lord. We're looking for the full meal. And, God, we know you will deliver to all. The gospel is for all. 
And we pray, God, that you show us how we take these steps, how we practically take these steps in our everyday life, that we leave here not with just this, 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 this hypothetical illustration, but they, we actually take steps in our life. We start praying over dinner. Yeah, we do that. We start praying with our kids. We start listening to some Joy FM in the car. We start, we start praying, you know, uh, at bedtime with our kids. We start coming to church more. We start telling God, telling people simple things like, hey, the Lord bless me. We, we have a blessed life. I'm thankful. God did this for me. Let us, let us take those steps, Lord, to get us out of that limited mindset because we know from our faithfulness in the past that you will deliver and be faithful in the future and that as we take those steps you will just keep continuing to give more and shine more and reveal more and show us where you truly want us to be and if everybody could say in the mighty name of jesus amen